So thank you very much for having me today. Hello to everybody here and joining online. As I said, my name's Sarah and I run a business called Layer 8. And our sole purpose really is to enable every person in every organization to become a champion of security culture. So you can probably imagine how stressed I felt the day that I found out I couldn't prove the return on investment for the champions programs that I was running. So the day actually started all right. I'd been invited into a really awesome client of mine um, to review the programs as a Zoom call. And I'm talking about all the great things we're doing to engage the security champions. And then he stops me and he says, that's great, Sarah, but how is it reducing risk? It's like a million thoughts flood through my mind and I'm saying about how we're engaging people and what the presentations are and how people are downloading materials. And he stops and he says, no, no, you're not telling me how this is reducing risk. I'm getting frustrated. I can't articulate my point. He's getting frustrated. And by this point, his head is wagging and his arms are moving around. So what I want to talk to you about today is the ever evolving approach that we have taken to measuring the effectiveness of a champions program. But before I dive into spreadsheets, I need to start with another story. I need to talk to you about what we are measuring. And this story is quite different to the first one. This is a live, it's a face-to-face -face event. I've got 40 security champions sitting in a room with me. And I've just asked them to share a story about a time they felt alive, engaged, and completely committed to their business. When one of them jumps up and he says, oh my gosh, have you met Bob? Bob is a hero. Do you know what Bob has done to protect our business? He said, do you know what? I've worked with Bob for 20 years and I never knew he'd done this. I I'd never had a conversation with him. So I think at that point, I had two, two of my own, oh my gosh, moments. And the first one was, is it possible that conversation could be our catalyst for change. Because conversation allows us to give people context. We can ask questions, we can seek meaning and clarification. And secondly, could talking about what works actually drive change? Yes, what works? We're so used to talking about what's going wrong and the risks and the weaknesses. But here was a group of people that actually an hour earlier had looked at me with a kind of death wish in their mind, I think, because I'd asked them to have a conversation with each other. But now we're getting people jumping out of their seats, telling me that people are heroes. So I figured, have I found something new? Or is there some research? I wanted to find out a little bit more about what there was around conversation and positive thinking. So I found loads of different models, but two that I want to talk to you about a little bit to give you some context. First of all, the Edgar Schein model for organizational culture change. And he talks about the fact that organizations will create logos and artifacts, strap lines, espoused values. But actually, the way decisions are made in organizations are based around basic assumptions. And it's the stories that are told and retold over and over again that become ingrained in our culture and the way we do things. So something, some research out there about conversation being the catalyst for change. The second model I want to point you towards is David Cooper Ryder's Appreciative Inquiry. And this is a flipped change model. So it starts by asking questions around what works. Because when we know what works in an organization, in a team, in a person, then we can find out why. 
and we can build change based on strengths. So over the last sort of seven or eight years that Layer 8 has been in existence and we had that, oh my gosh, moment, we've developed that into a formula for security champions. It's conversation, collaboration, and a positive focus that allows security champions to influence behavioral change. And I'm telling you this because this is what we're going to look to see if we can try and measure. Can we measure that conversation, collaboration, and positivity means that champions can influence change and that we can reduce risk? So there's a big blueprint that sits underneath it. Not enough time to talk to you about that today, but I'll show you at the end how you can get access to some resources on the blueprint. So let's go back to the problem. Metrics, that's the title of my talk, the metrics. In some ways, we've got so many metrics in the security world, haven't we? We've got all of these things that come in from our phishing reports. We've got things that come into the SOC. We've got things that come into our incident reporting teams. But what do we measure? And also, I'd like you to raise your hand if you have ever tried to find metrics and data about what people are doing right. And if we try to, try to find, I can see one or two people saying they've tried to find metrics about what people are doing right. Anyone found them? Anyone? No, I can see shaking of heads, shake of heads. So a couple of months ago, I was at InfoSec, which is one of the UK's industry conferences on information security. So imagine the scene. It's a massive hall and there's loads and loads of technology and software vendors in there. And usually I'm running away because, you know, they're trying to sell something. But this time I wanted to ask them a question. They're coming up to me and saying, can I tell you about all the good stuff my software does? Can I show you all of the risks and weaknesses and gaps and bad things that are happening? And I asked each of them, can you tell me, can you show me in your software when people are doing things right? No, nope. I didn't find one, but, but I do make two caveats on this point. First of all, I didn't speak to every single software vendor in the room. There may be some out there that are measuring what people are doing right. And the second thing is, I'm not talking about the awareness and culture vendors, some of who are in this room, who I do know are starting to measure what people are doing right. So back to the challenge at hand. I'm kind of wedged, if you like, in between my first story, let's call my first story the one with the waggy head, my client who I cannot prove any return on investment for his champions program. And story number two, Let's call it the one with Bob, the one where I can see all of these absolutely awesome stories about what people are doing right and how that is snowballing with each conversation that people are having. But I can't prove that those conversations and the things that the champions are doing are having an effect on risk reduction. So what I'm going to show you now on the screen is a real but sanitized example of a metric pack for an organization. Um, I'm going to talk you through it. I'm going to explain all the bits and pieces in it. And then I'm going to tell you what we did to, to put that together. So the first thing that you'll see is behavior. Now I'm just showing you for one behavior for the Champions Program. You may have sort of four to six different behaviors. And I want you to notice two things about the behavior up there. Colleagues report security incidents and suspicions immediately. First of all, the behavior is about the security awareness or culture program overall. The measures underneath it, yes, are about how champions have helped. But actually, what we are trying to measure is the effect that the champions program is having on the behaviors that you're trying to change for your entire program. 
So it's about linking it in to your awareness strategy. The second thing I'd like to notice about the behavior is it is an action. It, it's got verbs in it. It's something that people can do. You know, quite often we might pick a topic like fishing. Fishing what? Like, what do we want people to do with fishing? What's the behavior that sits within that or set of behaviors that we want people to do as a result of it? Okay, so have a look then on the left-hand side where we can see our leading measures. A leading measure is really an indicator. On its own, it's not going to tell us how effective our Champions Programme is, but it will help us refine. So we are measuring things like office coverage. Have we got champions in each office? Now, depending on how your organisation is set up, organisation could be replaced with department or region or, or function. Then we've got champion participation. Are they attending the sessions you put on for them? Are they downloading the materials? And then champion activity. What are they doing? Are they engaging with the business? Are they sharing materials and running sessions? And you can see we've got a percentage and we can show whether that has gone up or whether that has gone down from the last time we reported. So at the bottom, you can see some things like engagement, eagle, habit, parrot, etc. These are just fun ways of collecting the stories. So it's also really important to collect how our champions are engaging with the business. Are they collaborating? Are they sharing the, the habits regularly, repeating them? Are they sharing positive stories? So we can start to collect that qualitative data. Then over on the right, I think as you're looking at it, yes, is our lagging measures. And here we are trying to collect things that people are actually doing, things that have happened. So for the behaviour of reporting security incidents and suspicions immediately, we probably would want to know what's the time difference between an incident occurring and somebody reporting it. So five minutes in this example here. We also want to know about champion feedback. So a champion is as much about giving us feedback in security so we can tailor our processes and policies and tools as it is about us in security asking them to disseminate messages for us. So what has champion feedback done? What's it telling us? So here we've got seven pieces of champion feedback. The example is, the Paris office added the reporting button to their home screen to make it easier to report security incidents. And finally, we've got incident avoidance. If we're asking for a behaviour of colleagues must report incidents and suspicions quickly, immediately, there must be a reason for that. And the reason is that if we know, we can do something about it. So let's collect that information about what happened as a result of the feedback and the immediate reporting that's been given. So what we've got is we've got a set of measures over here that really relate to the story of the one with the waggy head. They keep them interested. They tell them what has happened as a result. We've got a load of measures over here that relate to the story of the one with Bob. They're telling us about how people are engaging, about the collaboration, about the positivity. And then we've got the measures that connect the two together, that tell us where we are having successes or where we've perhaps got areas that we need to look in a bit more detail. So when we dig under the surface, for example, we might see that in one office, we have no security champion or they're not participating in the events, they're not engaging their colleagues. And actually, that is having a negative effect on the reporting time. There has been no champion feedback. And in fact, far from avoiding incidents, incidents are occurring. 
So we realise that it's really important to sort of collect both sides of the story. We want the qualitative stats about the stories and the things that people are doing and how they're participating, but we need to link those for the qualitative statistics, um, the quantitative statistics even, about how it's reducing risk. So we're able to really prove that the champion activity is having an effect on risk reduction. So I'm going to talk you through how we got there. And like I said, it is always evolving, always evolving. Um, now, when I first wrote this presentation, I think it was about three hours long because there was so much detail in it. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just give you one thing that we learned and one tip for each of these six steps of the process. First of all, we need to define the behavior. So what I learned really painfully sitting in that Zoom meeting is that I had no clue to begin with what behaviors I was actually trying to measure. I didn't know what on earth was going on you know, when I was put in that position. So of course we need to do our research here. We need to talk to our risk teams. We need to talk to our SOC, but also we can talk to our champions. So our champions are excellent sources at helping us define the behavior. We can talk to them about risks and we can talk to them about threats, but they know the critical touch points in their processes that are relevant to them so that we can create a behavior that, they, that resonates with them, that they can identify. So using our champions to help define the behaviors is really helpful. Secondly, we need to agree our key results. And we, we found quite early on that people are really used to dealing with the negatives. You know, they're really used to finding out how many people have done bad stuff, how much data has been lost, how many phishing clicks have we had. But when we challenged them and said, we need to find the opposite, we need to find what people are doing well, they weren't so comfortable with that. So really being able to join the dots between the stories and the things that people are doing well and how it's reducing risk is very important. We need to find the data sources. So as I've already said, it's really rare that the systems and tools that we've got sort of monitoring and analyzing our networks are giving us the data that we need right away. But it's much easier to get a system change in place if there is a clear line of sight back to business risk. So for example, in the behavior that I was demonstrating around reporting security incidents and suspicions quickly, there was no way in this particular audience, uh, organization to find out the time difference between reporting and an incident occurring. That needed a system change. So much easier to do if people understood why and the line of sight back to business risk. Collect the data. Kind of sounds obvious, but we need to put in those regular touch points to make sure that the data is coming to us. Ideally in an automated way, but we found that it was so hard to get that. That actually we had to go to champions and ask champions to tell us what they were doing but they forget. So we would also find that there was loads more champion activity happening than they told us about. And this is where putting in those awards um, and gamifying it really helped us. So people could just do a quick, yeah, I had a conversation about this. I presented a management presentation about that, etc. But we need them to be inclusive. So just because we have some awesome person in the organization like Bob, who runs out and is a hero and is sharing loads of stories, we don't want to only award Bob because what about the other people that are doing really good stuff as well? So we want to be able to award anything that a champion is doing because it's far better than nothing at all. We need to then present the data. So where are you going to take this? Is it going to go to a risk and governance committee? Is it going to go into your 
security management team. We need to find a, a place where the security champion metrics are going to be represented. And we did find on the first few times that we did this, that sometimes the security teams didn't want to hear what champions had to say. They're giving feedback about processes and policies and the ways to do things. And the security department are kind of going, yeah, but we're the experts, they're not. So being able to show case studies from other organizations was a great way to get them to listen and use the data. So we found that having regular touch points to review and look at that leading data was really helpful. So we could see, for example, is there a drop off in meeting attendance? Are people not downloading the material? Have we made the ask too hard? Has something clashed with people's meeting time slots? So we could remedy the situation before you get to the end of the campaign and suddenly think, oh, we didn't reduce risk. And of course, then we can use that data to help build the business case for more champions across the business. So bringing that together um, into a bit of a, a roadmap, I guess we want to design our champions networks where possible with measurement in mind from the outset. So if we are considering a champions network, what is the purpose? What's gonna be different when your champions network is done and it's effective compared to what's happening today. And then we can recruit with that purpose in mind. We can identify the behaviors that we want our champions to focus on, and we can get our champions to help define those behaviors. Find the data sources. So I've got a little one there because it's tricky to find the data sources. So often we would recommend starting just with one behavior. And once you've found the data sources and created a framework for that behavior, you can move on to the other behaviors. And people like to start with a behavior around phishing because I guess that's one area of the stats in, in an organization that there's probably already a lot of data coming through for. So people quite find it quite easy to start with phishing. And once you're capturing that data and you're going and demonstrating the business value at your meetings, then you continually learn, evolve, and develop. So three things that you can really define right now to start your metrics program. And these all relate to conversation. So first of all, go out and research and talk to people and find out what are you measuring? Talk to your champions, talk to your risk teams. Secondly, how are metrics presented right across your business at the moment? There's no point having the best security champions dashboard. And then you find out that when you talk to you presented at the risk committee that people say, this doesn't look anything like how we measure and use data at the moment. So think about how you can link it into your other corporate dashboards. And thirdly, find out who owns the data sources. I literally cannot tell you how many months we got delayed through not knowing who owned, for example, Yammer in an organization. So we wanted to collect some stats on Yammer. Who owns Yammer? I don't know. You know, a massive organization. It took months to find out who owns Yammer. And then we get to it and then we work out, oh, it doesn't collect the data that we want. Now we need a system change. Six months later, we're just about collecting the data. So if you can start to find who owns those data sources early, that would be a fantastic help. So I mentioned, um, some resources. Um, I haven't got a snazzy QR code like Jeremy's, unfortunately, but I have got um, a, a URL there. Um, on our website, if you want to access the blueprint, but also two specific resources around metrics as a masterclass, 
and also a data sheet on setting up metrics programs, then please go in and freely download those materials. So I want to, I want you to imagine this. I go back in to that meeting with the one with the waggy head. And this time I am able to say to him, do you know what happened last month? Lucy received an email. It was from her manager. And the email read like this. Hey, Lucy, I totally forgot to change my bank details. I was in such a rush with moving. I completely forgot to change my bank details for payroll. You know I'm in transit now. Could you just sort this out for me? Everything in there was accurate. It had come from her manager. Her manager was in transit. But a conversation with her security champion made her stop, made her think, and made her do two things. The first thing she did is she said, I'm going to report this. I'm going to report this now to security. The second thing she did is made the decision not to please her boss, not to change the pay details, but just wait and find out if it was actually the boss. As a result of that, two things happened. She saved the pay. It wasn't her boss. And she stopped ransomware. The PDF had ransomware. She stopped that going right, right across the business. So we were able to say in that meeting, from a conversation, you have been able to reduce the risk in your organization. And you'll be pleased to know no more waggy head on that occasion. So thank you very much. I think that I've got quite a bit of time for questions if anybody has them.